I'm going to talk to you about 97 is. Some of you might know about this, might not. Um, I was born in 1971. 43. Anyone else born in 1971? Good. Anybody here born in 1997? <laughs> <laughs> They'll be about 17, 18 now. This is all about them. So this is the internet now, basically. It is <laughs> selfies, <laughs> food, and kittens. That's my kitten. <laughs> and this is kind of the, the people that I'm going to introduce to you are your kids, my kids. And uh, they grew up with social media. So they grew up with this internet, not the Tim Berners-Lee internet. They grew up with that kitten internet. And uh, they are now 17, 18. And they're about to come out onto the job market. Some of them have already. And because of their experience of identity, social activism, learning, all of these things I'm going to go through, their lives are completely different in so many ways. And when they come into our own organizations and into our lives, they're going to disrupt it in a way that I don't think anybody else has managed to disrupt anything yet. But they are the leaders. They are the first movement of kids that have experienced this, and they are <coughs> breaking the path for all of the kids that come behind them, and they need lots of support. I'm going to start with the story of Kevin. It's not really the story of Kevin, but it's a great slide. So Kevin. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, he's actually from Young Rewind State and uh, is a 97er and was working with us on a hack um, that we were doing for an organization called Refugees United. And um, he was working in a team. And what they were trying to solve was um, the problem that Refugees United had in Kenya, where they had um, refugees coming over the border from Somalia and um, going into refugee camps. But in order to go into refugee camps, they had to separate out. So families were coming over, splitting up into individuals. And you know, as a single person, they could get into a refugee camp. Refugees United was out there trying to put families and villages back together, so to give some people kind of some semblance of normality or whatever. Problem was that people, they were taking people's names, and people were either giving false names or too many of the names were the same. Or in some instances, when their position in society or if they were a woman, if they became a mother, their name actually changed. And so they were trying to find a way of matching people. And how could they do that if they didn't do it by name? Tons of people on the ground and nothing much they could do. Lots of phones. And so Kevin was working uh, in, in this group. And they um, looked back into the Somali history and discovered a lot of storytelling. And so um, Kevin was just like, well, it's obvious that if we do a thing whereby we can record um, people telling stories from either their family or from their local village, and then wrote an algorithm, and then you could actually record that story, and then the algorithm would match words and names and say, you and you are likely to be telling the same story, and therefore you two probably are matched or you're supposed to be together in the same family or whatever. <coughs> and that got me thinking about the way that people like Kevin, the 97ers, automatically think. And it's identity, and it is so driven by social media. Because if you think about Facebook, even though I know the kids aren't on Facebook anymore because people like me are. <laughs> but if you think about it, it's a great example because they kind of, they've taken it to all of the other platforms, Vine, Instagram, and the ones that I'm not allowed to know about. <coughs> but um, they'll take a photograph of themselves. They might have a completely different name on there. It won't necessarily be their real name, and most often not their name. So they'll take a photograph, and then they've got their friends that are tagged in that photograph, and other friends are tagging them in their photographs. <laughs> and so they've got that peer verification. They're also storytelling by saying, here, this is me at this party, this is me at this school, this is me at this thing, this is me. And so they are, they are showing each other that they are who they say they are because they are identifying each other, they are telling stories, and they are in each other's stories. See, you see how that translates out. They are not used to a world where you have to produce a piece of paper to prove who you are and what your name is. And to them, the name is kind of slightly irrelevant. <coughs> Bay, that's a good name. But if you think about identity, and then you think about these kids that are coming out, and they're going to be going into these jobs where they're going to be um, 
working with people like us and how are they going to actually take what they know about identity and apply it to everything that we do? How are they going to bring that storytelling in and how can we use that? Learning, learning is an interesting one. I love this. Uh, does anybody know um, Ivan Illich and Deschooling Society? It was written in 1971 when I was born. And uh, so this is, this is really not a kind of, you know, a new thing. And it's free on the internet. You can download it. Amazing. And um, I love this quote because he talks about how you can transform each moment of li living into learning, sharing, and caring. And he was seeing this back in 1971. And now we kind of go, we shouldn't really be spending all of this time transforming everything into learning, sharing, and caring. You should come down and watch telly. And it's like, actually, what we need to do is kind of look at how this works with education. He goes on to talk about education. I haven't got all of his quotes here because we could be here forever. But he actually talks about finding experts and then connecting those e experts through a network technology. And then those people would be able to teach our kids, which is effectively what's happening. So the kids are learning from each other online. And I think that this big coding movement that we have at the moment, and you know, I was kind of you know, all for that, kind of championing that. But I think a lot of the reason why this is breaking in schools is because if the kids can learn how to code outside of the school in a far better way than they can learn to code in the classroom, because there is no way any teacher is going to be able to keep up with the amount of languages and the amount of things that these kids need to know, they have to learn outside the classroom and bring it in. And that kind of flipped classroom mentality that Illich talks about, that everybody is kind of talking about in this space at the moment, makes sense for programming. If it makes sense for programming, why does it not make sense for geography or history or everything else? And so actually, this really starts to break everything down. And when these kids, these 97ers, again, they're 17, 18 now, when they go into politics, when, when a 97er is, is the director of education or whatever, you know, is... Kind of, you know, is, is in these roles of kind of making decisions about what happens in education, they will more than likely bring what makes most sense to them, which is learning outside the classroom and bringing it in. So if we don't do this, if we don't look at the way that we teach our kids, teaching them outside the classroom, and then letting them share together because of everything that they know already, they're going to do it to us anyway. So I think education is a really key thing for us that we can kind of prepare and learn. This is scary, because <laughs> if you think about those 97ers now, and you think about all of their networks, and they're kind of, they're busy learning, and they're talking, and you know, what they're learning, it doesn't matter, and you know, might not approve, but you know. Um, but the other thing they're doing is they are influencing. So I'm sure lots of you are familiar with um, people asking uh, their friends to tag stuff or to like stuff, so it's kind of like this, so that they've got immediate verification that what they are saying is true or has chimed with their community, right? So then they can see immediately if they've said something, whether it's actually kind of worked or whether they need to change the message, message slightly. And if they change the message slightly and then suddenly their communities immediately tell them, yeah, we get it, we get it, and they share and they like and they do all of that. Th these kids have been doing this for years. That's all they know. They don't know any different. So they know they have their communities. They know how to activate their communities in real time in a way that we could never, ever have. We just don't have that kind of experience. And they know no different, which is great when, it's wanting, when they're wanting to kind of do something you know, about a campaign that everybody cares about and something that's for good. But when that is the terrorist or when that is someone who is wanting to do evil and bad things, and they know how to activate their networks. What happens then? Because only the 97ers will be able to recognize and shut down in some way those people that are doing bad things, because we don't know. We just don't understand how to do this. But it's something that I think we should be watching and learning. And ISIS is a very good example of this. Work. <laughs> I have to scamper through everything, because this, this topic is so broad, I need you all to kind of think about it and, and take it away and kind of, you know, noodle it in your head. But with work, all of these kids have grown up with recession and terrorism and unrest in their kind of awareness. So in their, in, in their social media feeds, they've seen it. And um, in their families, their parents have lost their jobs or their friends' families have lost their jobs. And, you know, everywhere, it's, you know, everything's a bit of a struggle. 
and has been for all of their kind of grown-up life, you know, the life that they've actually kind of been cognizant of what's happening everywhere. And now they're coming out into the working world and everybody's saying, go and get a nice job in a nice big safe organization, go and do that, you know, go and work for Marks and Spencer's or go and work for somewhere else. And all they've seen is their friends' parents or their parents kind of in these safe organizations and safe jobs losing their jobs. And the only people really who are in a position of safety and security and are kind of, you know, succeeding at the moment are the, are the entrepreneurs, the people that are kind of supplementing their income. And so there's an unrest amongst the 97ers that I'm seeing at the moment. And because the way that they learn and the way that they get direction is by looking to their community and seeing what everybody else is doing, there's a lot of introspection. So there's a lot of this accusation going on at the moment about those teenagers kind of saying, you know, what are all these kids that are kind of wasting time online? I don't think they are. I think that these kids are actually looking to their communities saying, what are you doing? Because everybody's leaving school and it just doesn't make sense, this world. And so the YouTubers are huge because the successful YouTubers have found a way to kind of make money and run a business. They're the only ones. So I think we need to allow these children to go back into their communities to look to each other and we need to support them and help them find a way out of this in a way that makes sense and encouraging entrepreneurship is always a good idea. Maslow's hierarchy of needs. <laughs> I'm sure you recognize this. It is so true. It really is true. And, uh, you know, it's kind of, if we accept that this is fact, all right, and uh, again, for the 97ers, they know no different. You know, it's kind of, everything depends on this. And if you haven't got this, and, you know, how are we going to have the rest of this? We know that, of course, there are other ways to get all of this, but they don't. And so the difference between the 97ers is that this is their hierarchy of needs. And with us, it, it isn't. And I don't know that there's necessarily a right or wrong, but there is certainly something that we need to do to be able to encourage them to find other ways to do this, as well as learn from them about how we can make all of our hierarchy of needs, it is the same as theirs, but without Wi-Fi sometimes, uh, something that is attainable for everybody. But I would say the most important thing that I would really like you to take away <laughs> from this really is about identity. So at the beginning when I was talking about how they identify themselves and they identify each other and do all of this, and we worry about them being online and then people being online pretending to be other people, they can spot those people. And by us interfering with their identity, then we really start to interfere with their community and we need to trust them a little bit more and we need to understand them a little bit more. But we've still got cats, of course my cat she's lovely and uh, I put the cats up there because I'd like I like to think of the 97 as as kind of you know they're, they're just we're allowing them to be natural to their feelings it's all they know they don't know any different so in the same way that my cat <coughs> brings me mice these young people are behaving in a way that makes sense to them and it is very different to what makes sense to us and so we need to allow them that freedom but we also need to keep them safe and I'm going to finish with the fabulous llama, just because I can. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Thank you.